Okay, so welcome uh, everyone. My name is Gideon Taylor. I'm the Chair of Operations for the World Jewish Restitution Organization or WJRO. It's my great pleasure to welcome you today to a special webinar to mark the one year anniversary of the groundbreaking Just Act report, which was the US government's first ever comprehensive review of the state of restitution of Holocaust era assets. The report reflects the tremendous importance that the United States government places on finding a measure of justice for Holocaust victims, for survivors, for their heirs. And we are enormously pleased and fortunate to be joined today by Sherry Daniels, the United States Special Envoy for Holocaust era issues for Holocaust issues of the United States State Department. Um, we're gonna have today a one-on-one -on -one conversation addressing recent Holocaust era property achievements in Europe uh, and a discussion about thoughts, ideas on how best to move forward. Today, we have participants from 16 different countries. And I think that's just a sign of how broad the interest and concern about this issue is. For those of you who have not attended one of our WGRO webinars before, I'd like to say welcome. Uh, to many of you who've joined us before, I say welcome back. So as many of you are aware, WGRO represents world jury in pursuing claims for the recovery of Jewish properties in Eastern and Central Europe. We are an umbrella organization representing 14 major Jewish international and Holocaust survivor organizations in the US, Israel, Europe, uh, and around the world. Uh, during the Shoah, the Holocaust, the Nazis and their allies robbed millions of Jews of their every possession, as well as the possessions of the Jewish community. And more than uh, 75 years after the end of the war, Holocaust survivors and their families around the world continue to seek restitution or compensation for their property that was wrongfully seized by the Nazis and their allies or subsequently by the communist regimes. And for Holocaust survivors, this issue is not often about the money or the amount of money. It's about an issue of principle. And it's about, about an issue of connection to a world that was destroyed. So one year ago on July 29th, so the anniversary is tomorrow, the US State Department issued this report, the Just Act report, a groundbreaking report. So as it said, as it noted, some countries in Europe have emerged as leaders, making significant pro progress in international commitments uh, to Holocaust survivors and their families. Uh, and other countries, sadly, are neglecting those responsibilities and promises. Today, we'll try and look at some of those countries and to look at some of those issues and how they may be relevant to your personal experiences and to issues and to issues that you care about and that the Jewish world and the non-Jewish world care about. So a little housekeeping first. Um, if you have uh, any questions, uh, you can type them at any time into the question box at the bottom of the screen. So we will try and follow the questions and see if we've time, we'll try and answer some of those questions. If you, you already sent in some questions, we'll try and get to those and any questions that you would like to uh, pose uh, during the session. Um, since the uh, Just Act report, both President Biden and Secretary of State Blinken have committed in very strong and moving terms to prioritize the issue of Holocaust era property restitution. The president said expressly that the United States, quote, will continue to champion justice for Holocaust survivors and their heirs. And then in March of 2021, Secretary of State Blinken emphasized in a letter, quote, it is troubling and unacceptable that the work of restituting or providing a measure of compensation for property wrongfully seized during the Holocaust is still not complete in so many countries. And he assured WGRO in his letter to us that he and the State Department will continue to work with countries to help them meet their commitments. Um, before there was a Just Act, um, Congress passed legislation to create and provide and establish the need for such a report. That law was co-sponsored by Senator Tammy Baldwin, Democrat of Wisconsin, and Senator Margo, Marco Rubio, Republican of Florida. And that bill was passed unanimously by both houses of Congress. 
And that's, I think, a sign, the fact that it was unanimous um, and across the political spectrum shows how wide the support is for Holocaust restitution and for the idea of justice for Holocaust survivors. Both senators, Baldwin and Rubio, have strongly supported Holocaust survivors and their families in the struggle to find justice for property that was confiscated. So they weren't able to join us today, but they did ask uh, to send a message. And we'd like to share those video messages with you uh, uh, to us on this, the one year anniversary of the Just Act report in which they played such a leadership role. So Senator Baldwin's comments. Hi, I'm US Senator Tammy Baldwin from the great state of Wisconsin. Today, we're recognizing the one-year anniversary of the groundbreaking Just Act report. By teaming up with Senator Rubio and the World Jewish Restitution Organization, we worked to get the bipartisan Just Act signed into law. Holocaust survivors and the families of Holocaust victims have waited far too long to recover or receive compensation for what is rightfully theirs. By making this issue an American foreign policy priority, we are signaling to the world that those who have failed Holocaust victims will be held accountable. Just last week, my colleagues and I led a bipartisan group of senators in calling on Polish President Andrzej Duda to uh, demonstrate the Polish Senate's clear opposition to the crimes committed by Nazi Germany. We will continue to press our friends and allies in Europe to ensure survivors receive justice and can live out their days in dignity. Congress will not look away. We will continue engaging countries and encouraging progress so that a year from now, there will be more successes and more progress. Thank you for everything you do and have a great day. This is Senator Marco Rubio, and I'm honored to join the World Jewish Restitution Organization as we acknowledge the one-year anniversary of the Justice for Uncompensated Survivors Today Act of 2017 report. I co-sponsored the Bipartisan Just Act because I believe the United States should be fully committed to achieving justice for survivors of the Holocaust and for their families. The Holocaust was one of the most horrific events in world history. It resulted in the systematic murder of six million Jews as well as the organized theft of their possessions and property by the Third Reich and the Axis powers. For generations, survivors and their families of this tragedy have endeavored to secure long overdue restitution of their property. The passage of the Just Act was an important step towards ensuring our partners and allies deliver this justice by enhancing the State Department's efforts to facilitate long-deserved restitution to survivors and their families whose property was stolen during the Holocaust. The Just Act report last year provides important details on the efforts of countries across Europe to facilitate the restitution of property to survivors and their families. However, more work remains. Currently, the Polish legislature is considering a bill that would invalidate almost all property restitution claims. This only highlights the need for the Just Act report as a vital tool. I will do all that I can to ensure restitution of property stolen during the Holocaust remains an American foreign policy priority. The United States will continue to press our friends and allies in Europe to ensure survivors are provided the justice they deserve. Great. Well, I think um, it's, uh, we all owe a tremendous uh, debt of gratitude to uh, Senators Baldwin and Rubio, who really taken such a leadership role in advocacy um, for Holocaust survivors and for, and for justice. So it's, uh, I'm really privileged uh, to welcome today uh, Sherry Daniel. So Sherry, uh, it's great to have you with us. Sherry has served as a uh, special envoy for Holocaust issues since August 2019. Uh, Sherry is a career member of the Senior Foreign Service. She's brought a wealth of knowledge and experience. And I've had the chance to travel uh, with, um, uh, with Sherry, to be in meetings together with Sherry, to be a, a witness and a participant and a partner in discussions with governments, with a number of governments. Um, her, she's uh, taken a lead role in the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, where she leads the US delegation, uh, which is an international grouping of countries. Um, she's been uh, uh, held the one year chairmanship of the International Commission of the uh, International Tracing Service, 
uh, and its legacy institution known as the Arrelton Archives, which holds the world, the wartime records uh, of over 17 million people. Uh, she's been involved and engaged in so many issues. I could spend a, a chunk of time uh, describing her uh, resume, but suffice it to say, uh, she has been a, uh, a really a tireless uh, advocate and a wonderful partner. So Sherry, uh, thank you for joining us and uh, really thank you for everything you've done. Um, I guess we wanted to kick off really with, this is a big anniversary. You spent a tremendous amount of time on the Just Act report. And in the lead up to the report, we had many conversations and there was, I just, it was obviously a huge undertaking um, what, what's your sense now a year on, what did you take from it? What do you, and where do you just tell us a little bit about what your uh, thoughts are on the significance of the report? Thanks Gideon. I'm so honored to be uh, invited to this webinar today and to get to, to speak to with you, uh, uh, and to a number of people, many of whom I know, and some of whom I don't, who are so passionate about this is issue as well, the set of issues I should, should say, because the Just Act report covers uh, restitution and compensation. It also covers a number of other issues on welfare of Holocaust survivors and, uh, uh and the status of, of communal property and cemeteries and, and other, other, uh, Judaic and things. So, uh, I can say, uh, on reflection, uh, you, you're exactly right. It was a, a blood, sweat, and tears, not only of my very small team, but really our uh, embassies in the 46 covered countries around the world who just really worked doggedly for months to produce that base of information that we would then take and, and fact check and, and, and add to back here in Washington. So I, I'm, I'm tr tremendously grateful. I've gotten to meet some of those uh, embassy teams and some of my travels and, and, and of course, have talked to many of them um, and, uh, and continue to follow up with them after the report was launched publicly last July 29. Um, you know, it was uh, the COVID pandemic was well underway at that time. So we ended up doing a series of virtual visits with a number of countries to get the ball rolling and say, look, we've now identified uh, in the in just the executive summary alone, you know, to get a dive in of this 200 page report in just those first 10 or 12 pages, one can get a sense of the depth of what happened and what the impact is and why it still matters. And I think the takeaway is uh, it's not a dry topic. It, it's a living topic. It affects living people. It affects their descendants. It affects justice for those of us who remain behind uh, in Europe and in the United States and around the world. So I, I come away um, uh, feeling grateful that we now have the resource that tells us what has been achieved in all of these countries as a baseline uh, and what still needs to be achieved, the areas for further development or areas for improvement that countries can work on and maybe compare. We wanted it to spur thought spur discussion. We wanted people to be looking at the different chapters and seeing what other countries did, comparing it to what mechanisms and measures they've taken. Uh, and as you said, there's some really, really positive stories in there. It's not an entire, uh, you know, a dark, uh, a dark book. It's rather a, a book of light where people can look at what has been done really well by several countries. And, and we hope that spurs the conversation in others. And we picked up that thread by going to those countries and speaking with those countries, as you know. So, um, you know, I think there have been some, um, some successes since then, and you know that's maybe something we we could discuss because I, I do want people to realize there is actually work that people realize they should do and can do, uh, and I think the other takeaway then is there's work that is doable. This is not something unachievable, pie in the sky, justice, you know, in in in, in fairyland. This is real justice. It's a measure of justice. We cannot bring these people back. We cannot we cannot undo the crimes that the Nazis committed. But we that remain behind uh, in the countries that then had to survive the communist uh, domination do uh, period uh, after World War II, uh, all of us can do more, do it better, and do it more quickly while the survivors are still living. So that that's really a takeaway I have. It's doable. It's approachable. Countries have done it. Let's get it done. Let's keep working on it. So terrific. So tell us, Sherry, what do you tell us about one of the successes that you've seen during your time, uh, maybe Luxembourg or well, maybe to talk a little bit about Luxembourg. That's certainly an interesting one. Um, give us a little background on that and how you see that. Uh, sure. You know, that that um, so this is an area where and I, I should say at the, at the get go, when you asked for my impressions, uh, looking back on the one year anniversary, I should also say that I state that we were incredibly lucky to have stakeholder organizations such as yourselves uh, and the expert advisor of the State Department, uh, Stu Eisenstadt, who helped us with g gathering many of these facts and getting the baseline. So I just want to get that in. I really appreciate it all the time that you and your colleagues at the claims conference and WJRO spent with me, my team. Um, so so it was already in train before I 
it came in in August 2019, some discussions with Luxembourg. You know, these things take years to negotiate. Data has to be driven, and yet people have to see what can be done and what was done, what wasn't done. Uh, and so at the end of the day, when the Just Act report came out, and there was a chapter on all these 46 countries, one of them was Luxembourg, and there were some action items in there, and they were discrete, definable action items. Uh, and so what I felt really good about was that at that time, we then could enter into uh, discrete uh, discussions, we as an advocate, uh, and the WJRO and the Jewish community of Luxembourg as actual negotiators vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Luxembourg government, uh, and negotiate what could be done to settle those, those, uh, those issues that were identified. And so uh, when in January of 2021, just you know, six or seven months ago, when there was then this agreement, uh, a framework agreement that was signed between the Luxembourg government on the one hand, and WJRO and the Jewish community of Luxembourg on the other, uh, it's a framework agreement that, that is really timeless, and I'm so privileged to have played any advocacy role, as did, of course, our Ambassador Evans uh, in, in, in our embassy in Luxembourg and his whole team. Uh, it will settle airless and communal property restitution uh, claims for real property. Uh, and it will establish a process for uh, insurance, art, and dormant bank account claims. And, and something that I'm very proud of, and I'm sure that you uh, and Ambassador Evans and, and the team there uh, uh, on the ground with the Jewish community worked on, it will establish uh, a new Holocaust Memorial and Education site uh, at the place from which Jews were deported from Luxembourg in St. Fontaine. So really, it's, uh, it, it, it was a remarkable achievement. Uh, and of course, it was a framework agreement. Now those things need to be implemented. But, but I'm extremely proud that they could look at their chapter, that they could look at what needed, to, what they had done well, what they could still do to help uh, Luxembourg citizens who had never uh, been, uh, been compensated for, for the property that was uh, confiscated from them. Uh, and they, they found a way to do it. It's achievable. It's spread out over a number of years. So doable, you know what I'm saying? This is this is what makes me proud to be part of that. And now to say to other countries, look at Luxembourg's example. You identify the problem, you pick you know, a percentage of the value of whatever it is that you think you can afford and you negotiate with the Jewish community and the survivor stakeholders, uh, which is your organization and all of its partner constituent parts. Uh, and you come up with a settlement that settles the issue. Right, and you know, I, I gotta say, Sherry, the, you know, having been involved in this since when, when we started, the starting point of where the discussions began was at the U.S. Embassy in Luxembourg, as has been the case so much throughout history. And maybe we'll spend a minute just talking a little bit about the history, because your, uh, the engagement of the U.S. government is not something of the last few years, even not even the last 20 years. Um, but as just another example, uh, it started in the U.S. Embassy, where with the support of you and your office, the discussions began, continued. Um, uh, and so the U.S. government so central to uh, uh, to the to the work uh, of that negotiation, and I think, as you said, what it sought to do was to draw together the financial uh, individual uh, payments to individual Luxembourg survivors, which are now in process to deal with property, with bank accounts. And there's a whole process, as you know, uh, again, helped by the uh, State Department that's worked out with the Luxembourg banks. We're in negotiations about an audit uh, of the banks and memory. And I think that that sort of combination uh, has been so critical to the whole legacy of the engagement of the, uh, of, of the State Department in, in these issues and you and your office. Um, before we move on from Luxembourg, maybe we just wanted to share a, uh, a short video from a Holocaust survivor from Luxembourg who was engaged in supporting, and we were in consultation uh, with him during these negotiations. I think just gives, uh, I think his perspective is kind of interesting. Um, maybe we can just uh, uh, share that with uh, the viewers. Shalom. My name is Isidore Marcel Solomon, a native of Luxembourg, a survivor of the, the Hitler years, and now living in Jerusalem, Ira Kodesh. Shalom. My father was originally born in the city of Lodz, Poland, and my mother was born in Luxembourg, but her parents were from the Ukraine. And he became a shoemaker in Luxembourg. He met this beautiful young lady, Ida von Agus. They fell in love. A couple of years later, my uh, late sister was born and she lived for a very short period of time. And then uh, in 1933, my brother Alex was born. And in 1935, March 3rd, I was born. 
we had a very good life because the there was almost no anti-Semitism in Luxembourg whatsoever. Uh, when Kristallnacht happened in 1938, my father called the whole family together and says, we got to make preparations to get out of Europe. One quiet morning, we heard like thunder coming into the city. But it wasn't thunder, it was the German, the Nazis marching into the city. And as they're passing our house, uh, two people came with a sign uh, which were pasted on the window of my father's store that said, Juden nicht betreten. Jew, Jews do not patronize. That's when we found out we're in trouble. And my father got in touch with the joint through Rabbi Serebrenik, and the joint chose us to be part of the, the uh, people going to the Dominican Republic. We're so grateful that we got to escape to the Dominican Republic, which by the way, was an absolute paradise. The sadness is that only two days after the end of the war, my mother got a, a message from the uh, Red Cross, International Red Cross, that her two brothers and mother were two days after we left, packed up and sent to de be destroyed at the Lodge ghetto. Well, the Luxembourg Agreement is very important to me. It made me proud to be a, actually I can say I'm a Luxembourger again in a sense. I, I am really grateful that something was, had been done. It was especially important and meaningful for me that this was actually signed on the International Holocaust Day, Memorial Day. And Ambassador Evans it was incredible. When, when we decided to visit Luxembourg, we were invited to Ambassador Evans' house. The um, Prime Minister Bettel came to, to Israel and I, I got the chance to meet him before he flew out. I'm very happy that after 75 years, people like myself and all over the world can still have justice after such a long period of time. I hope that this agreement will show all the other countries that have yet to move in the right direction to wake up and do the thing that is necessary to do. So great. Well, I think that sort of, uh, Sherry, I think that kind of in some ways just sort of tells you what it's, uh, what, what it's about, as you know, and I think we've all had a chance to uh, experience the, uh, the engagement of people like Marcel um, to hear those stories. So this goes sort of the role of the US government goes back a long way. So maybe just sort of, you can just give us a little bit of a context of, of, of how far back it goes and, and, and where it started. Um, that I think would be kind of very interesting for people. Sure, um, be pleased to do that. You know, um, the reason we're here as an office, the reason my office was established in 1999 in the State Department is because of uh, Ambassador Stu Eisenstadt, who's still very, very deeply engaged in this set of issues of restitution, compensation, justice, and memory. Um, and so his work during the Clinton administration uh, to negotiate with uh, the Germans, with the Austrians in the bilateral agreements, uh, and, and of course on, on, on uh, cross-cutting issues related to Swiss bank accounts and, and to, to other uh, bilateral agreements. This was the work that the foundational work where, where it came to, to light, uh, the scope of the issue, the scope of the theft. I mean, you know, archives were opened, uh, uh, the, the uh, Iron Curtain was opening, and all of a sudden you, you, we were able, uh, during that period of time, Time with Stu Eisenstadt's leadership and with the stakeholders group such as yourselves uh, and the claims conference, um, uh, able to make headway. And, and you know, you, you take a big issue and you divide it into parts and you get some stuff done year by year, month by month. And I'm so proud to, to, to know uh, that that work started and that then uh, Ambassador Eisenstadt had the, had the presence to say, we need to have a special envoys office with a staff of people who's gonna follow this issue up and get the rest of it, uh, work for a measure of justice for the other countries that have not yet finished the business. So uh, really for me, it is it, 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 it's, uh, it goes, as you said, decades, it's decades of work uh, and by our embassies across, 
across Europe um, uh, who, who had to get engaged and, and get in on this issue and get data and, and drive drive the agreement. So um, I hope to follow up in those footsteps. And I know that uh, that my office, a small team of people that we are now uh, here some 22 years later, um, uh, is going to keep working for that. You know, there were other successes along the way. Of course, you know, I can't even list all the all the agreements from the 90s, although we've done a, a, our best in the executive summary to sort of put that set the stage of what was done already. Um, but but just in sort of the more recent years, you 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 and I uh, uh, worked together back in in the 2014, 15, 16 timeframe when when Serbia was saying, look, they had private property restitution legislation, they had communal and religious property restitution legislation, but there wasn't any uh, legislation yet to address the issue of airless and unclaimed property. And lo and behold, with with uh, several of my predecessors' uh, effort and, and the stakeholders' efforts uh, in our am ambassador, Michael Kirby, and, uh, and his team, uh, negotiated in the Serbs passed a, a very good law, the first law after the, uh, after the Theresian Declaration of 2009. This was February 2016. The first country after the Theresian Declaration to have adopted a law that was compliant with the Theresian Declaration principles. Uh, what do you do with assets of those communities that were annihilated to a great degree and there are no heirs for, for their property? And, and, and they came up with, the, with what worked for them. Now we have 2021, Luxembourg came up with a different kind of agreement, a framework agreement that works for them. And so we want other countries that have not yet done so to, to get on board and find something, look at the other chapters, look what other countries have done, uh, compare some notes and, and, and be one of those lights, uh, to be a leading light, to be a leader and to put, put justice uh, to, to this issue. Um, uh, you know, in, in more recent times as well, since the Just Act report was released, you had uh, some really uh, powerful developments in the area of art restitution and provenance research. Um, uh, Stu Eisenstadt and I had, had the privilege of working with our embassy in uh, the Netherlands uh, to, to, to engage uh, with the government of the Netherlands and the, the Dutch uh, Minister of Culture had uh, in December 2020 uh, and just in June 2021 twice uh, issued a, a really a, a new restitution, art restitution policies, revisions that changed the balancing test and really uh, gave a, a, new, a new life, I think, I hope, to, to the art restitution and uh, art provenance research and restitution policies in that country, which we, we can outline. You can go through, you, you look at what was in the, the chapter on the Netherlands in the Just Act report, you compare it to what was done in the last uh, seven or eight months on that issue, and you say, look, someone can identify the, what wasn't done and fix it. You know, and so it really takes the, the, the mystery out of the process. Uh, in another way, the, the Just Act report uh, dealt with the issue of, uh, had a whole section for almost every chapter on, on the issue of welfare of living survivors. What was each country doing uh, to live up to its commitments under Theresien to, to address the, the welfare, the, the well being uh, of living survivors? And in that regard, the claims conference had uh, two amazing sets of negotiations just in the last two years with the government of Germany in uh, September 2020. Uh, and in May of 2021, uh, and in Germany significantly boosted its assistance to uh, Holocaust survivors worldwide, uh, especially for home care and health care needs, which are exponentially growing uh, uh, as, as survivors age and as the COVID pandemic restrictions uh, limit their access to that such care. So, you know, those are just some of the examples uh, of the different, uh, different successes. And, you know, each one of them uh, gives our team a new motivation to keep working. And, and, and we, we will continue to do that. Terrific, terrific, yes. So Sherry, not only do you uh, address and are engaged in the issues of Holocaust restitution and compensation, uh, your mandate is obviously a, a broad one, it's Holocaust issues. Um, so you're also, I've done a lot of work, I know, and uh, we've certainly been uh, so uh, proud to be partners and engaged with you in the work in Holocaust education, outreach, exchange, you've traveled, a great deal. Um, do you want to share with us perhaps some perspectives about the broader issues? I think you had some slides you were going to share with us. Um, uh, would be great to sort of hear your that broad perspective on the role and how you see it and what you you know, taken away from it. Sure. Um, so you, you alluded at the very beginning um, to some of the, uh, the work that my team does in representing the United States in different international fora. Um, you, you named a couple. The, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance is a big one of those uh, where policy is made, uh, uh, commitments are made at the political level and with experts from all over the world um, uh, on the issues of anti-Semitism, on the issues of Holocaust, combating Holocaust distortion and denial, which is a growing scourge that we really must all confront together. Uh, 
other uh, and on uh, dealing with honestly with with the past with the, the genocide of the Roma with with the the, the murder of the Jews uh, uh, and and with opening of archives all the ways that we can actually take a dark issue and, and bring light to the issue so pleased to do that work I also sit you know my position whoever's in my position uh, sits on the uh, as a board of on the board of trustees of the uh, memory responsibility and future foundation the EVZ foundation in Germany uh, and we're pleased to get to do that work and to see a body like that, that that really pushes hard on memory responsibility and future and coming up with grants to to take care of living survivors wherever they are of, of the Holocaust and of forced labor and of the Roma, uh, but but also to to do programs on memory. Um, uh, to name the others, you mentioned the uh, the International Commission of the International Tracing Service, which oversees now this ma massive uh, archive, the Arlson Archives in Bad Arlson, Germany. Uh, and there's one example here on the screen of the Stolen Memory exhibit, which the United States during our chairmanship year uh, just uh, provided announced funding of $100,000. Uh, Germany did something similar, and I believe uh, another country did something similar, all within the same period of six months, to say, let's help get this stolen memory exhibit to more areas of Europe. Let's let's put this uh, the, these uh, these memories and try to to link together these artifacts with with the families who, who from whom they were stolen. Uh, and also, they have at the Erlson Archives the Every Name Counts uh, social media campaign, which started small and is now uh, absolutely global. And its reach with millions of names that are on these uh, handwritten documents being transcribed so that they're data searchable, getting everything on the internet. So if people haven't looked lately at the Arielson Archives website, what you looked if you looked five years ago uh, and you look today, you're going to see that names that you couldn't find before, you didn't know what happened to your relative, you can now trace them. They have put all on the back end, getting all that data mapped so that it's connected and people can find something about their loved ones, whether it's forced labor or Holocaust or Roma victims of Nazi persecution. So those are just some examples uh, on the on the international organization front. Um, the other area I wanted to talk about, uh, I don't know if it's the next slide, is the uh, uh, the issue of the outreach. We've really, with uh, the grace uh, that we've had from our uh, leaders here in the State Department to get a little bit of extra staffing, some wonderful teammates have joined us and have really pushed forward our, uh, our outreach uh, and exchange programs, uh, our capacity. You got to build the capacity to get this stuff done. And, and that is to say, Gideon, um, not just to report how, you know, oh, woe is me. This is bad. This is bad. This isn't working. The trend lines are going the wrong way. But to say, let's build programs. Let's reach out to people. Let's see if we can turn the tide a little bit. Uh, number one, improving Holocaust memory, making it more historically accurate, uh, helping teachers network with each other and educators, not just teachers, community educators, network with each other in the form of these uh, uh, two, so far, webinars on teaching uh, transatlantic dialogues, teaching the Holocaust in challenging times. So those are available on our website now. We've done very proud to do those with the US Holocaust Memorial Museum uh, together and reaching um, uh, dozens of countries and uh, I think up to some 26 or 30 states in the United States, getting Americans, Europeans, and people from Canada and Israel as well and around the world together to network on that topic. And I have to say there are big challenges there. So we can talk about Holocaust education. It sounds easy, it's not easy. Uh, there's some real deep issues and we want to address them. Uh, and then uh, outreach to universities. You know, I've done uh, some outreach with the Arizona State University, my predecessor, Ambassador Ed O'Donnell, uh, is a professor there. We've done some outreach to his students. Uh, you see on the on the screen here, the University of Würzburg, uh, where I did a, a, an outreach to hundreds of, of students and, and professors there uh, earlier, I believe earlier this year. And then Twitter, we, we can reach, you know, with one tweet, sometimes the, the biggest ones uh, about the Nuremberg trial anniversary last year, something like 78,000 people. Uh, and in another case, tweets about developments in, in Poland or other countries of interest, we can reach 40,000 people easily. So overall, maybe half a million people reached. So that's again, you know, you see a problem, let's do a program, let's do some outreach. And I know your, your WJRO and the claims conference uh, are, are so, so active in that space. And so I'm honored to have done some social media campaigns together with you as well. And then just to mention exchanges, uh, it's a huge aspect of what we're doing. It's a growth aspect of what we're doing. And that is to say, let's identify the problem. Uh, Holocaust distortion is growing. Let's do let's do an exchange program, bringing Europeans uh, uh, virtually together with their American counterparts, not just from Washington, but around the United States. Uh, and so we had uh, so far this year uh, uh, two. Uh, we have a third, I think, in progress right now. Um, uh, the, the one that's going on right now is for the Arielson Archives staff and for the countries of the uh, eleven member International Commission. How to use archives as an education uh, uh, resource. 
you know, you got all these wonderful, talented people finding new information that was not available 10 years ago. How do you get that information out there to, to people in the education field, to students, to museums? So again, these are the types of topics we're addressing in exchange programs and, and uh, with, with the great support of the current administration, I'm sure we're gonna to continue to do more of those. Uh, in fact, one is wrapping up this week and I'm gonna to speak to them, I think tomorrow, uh, a month long program. So with that, maybe we can go to um, the issue of travel. Uh, you know, uh, I did get to travel, as you know, and you mentioned, we got to travel a, a bit before the COVID pandemic uh, had, had limited it. But even during that time, I was doing virtual visits with my team and with our embassies in the field. I did virtual visits, uh, meeting a whole array of people in a different set of meetings uh, over a period of like a week or two at a time. Uh, it was with Poland uh, in 2020. And uh, during the course of this year, it was uh, Latvia, Lithuania, Ukraine, uh, and Romania, uh, to name just a few of them. And then I got them when the travel uh, restrictions allowed, uh, I got on the road and I said, look, we take the Just Act report, we see what's identified in there, everything from restitution to pensions to uh, Holocaust education and commemoration. And let's, let's meet the right agencies of government. Let's meet the NGOs. Uh, let, let, let's meet the special envoys, my counterparts who sit with me in IRA. So you see on the screen here, Romania, my, my most recent trip just got back uh, maybe a week or, or 10 days ago, uh, met with uh, two state secretaries who you see on opposite sides of the screen, uh, Daniela Gitman on the left and, and Victor Mikula on the right, state secretaries of the foreign ministry, uh, and their new special envoy for promoting memory policies and combating anti-Semitism and xenophobia, Alex Muraru, there in the middle. So in, in those meetings, I'm going to, you know, I'm making a pitch. I'm saying, let's restart the restitution working group. You know, there's a few areas that, that could still be improved in terms of restitution of, of uh, or compensation uh, for, for certain types of property. Let's get that restarted. And, and let's look at the issue of Holocaust pensions, where Romania had, had so great, uh, wonderfully passed legislation to make those more accessible to people who did not maintain their current Romanian citizenship, but were of Romanian origin. And let's make a pitch to get that system working so American citizens uh, and others living outside of Romania who are Romanian uh, can access the Romanian pensions. So those are the types of discussions I had and, and, and not to mention looking at, uh, at their policy of memory and just seeing how we can help them as they launched a brand new museum uh, this year uh, commemorating uh, the Yash pogrom in Romania and, take, and acknowledging the Romanian involvement in that, in that terrible pogrom in 1941. So really they're making great strides where they're to you know, give a, a little spotlight. Having a visit, you could sort of put a positive spotlight and encourage that, that those developments. Really, I was proud to do that. Um, on the next slide, I think you'll see uh, Poland. Uh, that was, as you probably followed on uh, on Twitter, Gideon and, and your colleagues who are watching, that was a, a very intense sort of 11 or 12 day trip, uh, bookended as, as I would say, kind of on two ends with, with the commemorations of, of, of pogroms first in Kielce uh, from 1946. And at the end of my trip, uh, the Yedvabne pogrom from 1941, both had big anniversaries. Uh, great, you know, big turnouts and, 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 and a, a chance to, to explain uh, that Anti-Semitism has no place in our modern, modern uh, democratic societies. Stand shoulder, shoulder, shoulder to shoulder with the NGOs, the people, the government figures who turned up uh, and say, uh, those were tragic events, those were horrific events, those were crimes that were committed against the Jewish populations in those towns by the people who lived in those towns uh, and, and, and that hatred, xenophobia uh, and, and, and all forms of racial hatred uh, have no place uh, in our societies. And of course, also, as you can see there in the middle, uh, paying, paying tribute to, to the Warsaw Uprising of the people of Poland struggling against the Nazi persecution, very, very difficult situation where they themselves, uh, even non-Jews, uh, up to 2 million or 3 million uh, non-Jewish Poles were killed by the during the Nazi period as well, not just the three million Jews. So it was a, a really just a sense of uh, learning, commemorating, standing together with uh, Chief Rabbi Shudrick, as you see on the left, uh, going to uh, again to Auschwitz as I had done uh, on the 75th anniversary, going back there, uh, and then going to Yedvabne with Poland's new special representative for Jewish issues, uh, who has now taken the position of head of their delegation to the IRA. So that's Poland. And then briefly, I can just, you know, since we have just a few minutes, I can show you Lithuania. Uh, there's more of, of my Poland trip. I'll just point out on the left there of the screen, sorry to just step back for one second, Marian Turski, who I got to meet, who I thought just was so amazing at the 75th anniversary of Auschwitz, the speech that he gave uh, a survivor uh, there. Uh, he was the one to greet me at the Poland Museum and give me the tour of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising Monument. And then you see NGOs that I met with and the JCC in Krakow, the leader there, um, John Ornstein and the 
fantastic programs they do for survivors, but also outreach to the community and, and Hebrew education and, and survivor um, uh, social programs, just amazing. So anyway, great, great positive work, but also some very heavy times. Uh, we'll scan through the next one, which is Lithuania. Uh, and again, on Lithuania, you look at their chapter and you say, you know, let's, let's go back there. Let's see how everything's going. What can we fix? They've got the Goodwill Fund, Goodwill Foundation doing some amazing work. I met with parliamentarians, with the government, with mayors uh, in Kaunas and in, in Vilnius, uh, together with Paul Packer, who's standing there. We, we, we pushed on both fronts on uh, the issue of uh, cultural property, preservation of cemeteries, uh, re renovations of, of Jewish cultural heritage, uh, but also on restitution procedures. Uh, and on the policies of memory, which uh, need a lot of attention and our ambassadors doing some amazing work and some great programs with, with which you see there on the left, programs that we did uh, both in exchanges and in film screenings, you know, let, let's get in that space. If we see a problem with historical distortion by uh, revisionism by certain, let's, let's do a program. And so you see there on the screen, protect the facts. Uh, that's the campaign where we're getting involved in that, where our secretary is quite engaged. So those are just some of the things I wanted to point out. I don't want to hug all the time, but I really do think there's there's work to be done. The work is identified in the Just Act report. Now it's up to all of us, uh, government and non-government alike, to step into that space uh, with our Holocaust historians, with the USHMM, uh, with the Arrowson Archives, all the people who have the information. Let's get that information out. Let's break it down uh, so people can understand why, why we care so much. Honoring survivors is a huge part of what we do. It's all about what you do. So I'm so proud sometimes to get to be invited to programs that you that you uh, develop. Uh, here you see Secretary Blinken who met with Margot Friedlander in Germany after she spoke uh, and, and he spoke at the launch of the uh, the US-German bilateral Holocaust issues dialogue in June, on June 24th in Berlin. Uh, and then of course you see Irene Weiss uh, uh, on the screen at the top who was with us, one of our keynote speakers at the Yom HaShoah international event, a webinar outreach that we got hundreds of people from around the world, including at our embassies, but also governments and, and uh, uh, educators. Uh, that was Irene. Um, and then you have Marian Tursky there again. So they're about, it's all about them. Uh, and let's, let's lift them up and, and help them live out the, 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 their years of life in, in dignity and help the, the second generation as well to connect uh, with that history. Uh, with a small measure of justice, really something that I think is achievable. Let's break it down into small pieces and let's get it done. So I'll, I think I'll stop there. Great, Sherry. Wow. Just, uh, it just gives a sense of just the scope of what you and your office has done. So let's turn, we, there's some questions coming in. And I think one of the, uh, a number of the questions actually have been uh, on the, perhaps the, the big, the elephant, the, the big, the big issue, the 900 pound gorilla in some ways is Poland, obviously is of enormous significance for uh, our community. Um, so many Jews uh, here in the United States and around the world trace their descent from Poland. It was obviously by far the largest Jewish community before the war uh, that suffered uh, tremendous, huge, huge losses of life and, and consequently property. Um, it's been in the news. There's been uh, a number of steps. Obviously, WGRO has certainly been engaged. The U.S. government's been engaged and other governments. Um, so uh, I think, the, uh, judging by the questions, there's quite a few people listening today who are particularly concerned about this issue. So if you could bring us up to speed, um, uh, I think uh, that would be wonderful how you see it and where things are. Okay, sure. That, that's a, a good point. I mentioned my visit to Poland. Of course, I, I while I was there in Warsaw uh, on this particular visit just a few weeks ago, I, we were dealing directly our, our charge d'affaires there, uh, Bix Aliu and his, uh, of course, the ambassador who was there until January, Georgette Mosbacher, and their predecessors uh, ha, have all worked very hard on this issue. And, and now to see a piece of legislation on the uh, agenda about to uh, be considered for the final time by the, uh, the, by the same, the, the, the House of Parliament there on August 11th, we understand it's a very troubling piece of legislation and it has to do with you know what what it looks like to us and from what we can tell uh in our analysis of what's happening is that it would really unfortunately close the door um uh, which is already not very wide open <laughs> to put it mildly close the door to to those who are waiting for decisions on confiscated or, or nationalized property that was uh, nationalized during the, the communist era so to be very clear this was this would close the door on people who have not yet heard in their administrative procedures and they would just extinguish those claims, those pending claims, which we think would be would be terribly unjust to do and at odds with what uh, the commitments Poland made in the Theresian Declaration of 2009. So uh, Poland is a key ally and friend of the United States. This is uh, a very serious uh, 
relationship that has many aspects to it. And you know, the country made these commitments in 2009 in the Theresian Declaration to resolve remaining restitution issues in a fair, non-discriminatory way. Um, and uh, we, we really call upon our Polish uh, allies to, to live up to that and a, a successful process uh, for restitution or compensation of confiscated property. Uh, the terms used in the Theresian Declaration, which are quoted in the Just Act report, that process, those procedures should be uh, fair, non-discriminatory, expeditious, simple, accessible, transparent, and neither burdensome nor overly costly to the individual claimant. Uh, and if you read the Just Act report chapter on Poland, you'll see that their process, their current process, without a comprehensive national restitution uh, or compensation legislation, is it does not meet those standards whatsoever. So we continue, continue to seek adoption of a national comprehensive private property compensation law uh, or procedure or process that meets the commitments under Theresing. We're going to continue to raise those issues at all levels. Uh, Congress has raised those issues with their counterparts in Poland. Um, and, you know, this particular bill is, is uh, uh, it's, uh, it would be very unfortunate to, for it to pass uh, in the way that the, uh, the same would like it to pass. I think the Senate tried to make some good amendments, uh, the Polish Senate, and we would look to the polls to look very carefully at the impact this would have on their citizens and on, on, a, on our citizens. It's about the communist era. They should not be, in our opinion, closing the door and freezing in place the communist nationalizations of private property. That does not seem to be what modern democratic sovereign Poland stands for, is to freeze in place communist era nationalizations of private property. All right, and thank, thank you, Sherry. And you know, the State Department is and, and US, all the whole US administration has been so supportive on uh, of our, our view, your view, and, and, and working together. So, thank you for that. Um, uh, another question I see um, from one of the participants uh, on Poland just briefly asked about the 1960 agreement with the United States. Uh, maybe just a word on uh, on that issue. I also have a view, but I'm interested. In just I would like to hear yours um, sure. on on that agreement. Um, across all administrations, Democratic and Republican in the United States, the analysis of our legal affairs division of that 1960 uh, U.S.-Polish indemnification agreement is that it uh, it, it was uh, at people who were U.S. citizens uh, at the time. Uh, that their property was confiscated and therefore does not include, unfortunately, and did not include uh, any compensation for those who, who fled Poland and became American citizens later. And therefore, uh, it's not something that solved any of the issues at stake in the Just Act report. So, it, you know, it, we, we've, we do have a paragraph or two about uh, that 1960 agreement in the Just Act report chapter on Poland and I, our policy stands across all administrations uh, exactly the way it's written in that chapter. So I'd refer people to that. Terrific. So another uh, couple of people actually in the uh, in questions posed um, here I see are on Lithuania. Um, one question about the restitution you alluded to a little bit uh, a few minutes ago, maybe just sort of a little summary on where we're at on that. And then also a question on the issue of the sort of historical aspects of how perpetrators and are, are perceived and treated and, and, and this issue. Okay, um, very, very good set of questions. So with restitution, um, uh, the, the, the language we used in the Just Act report chapter on Lithuania is, is uh, it, that's still where things are. We're still trying to, uh, to, to get something going that would change that. But what, what, what we've said is that their uh, communal and religious property restitution program that established the Goodwill Fund and has used those, that fund of restituted or compensated property for the purposes outlined in the Theresian Declaration is a, is a, is a gold standard. It's a great thing. Uh, what they could do better on and what we would like them to work on is the issue of individual private property restitution claims or compensation claims from those who didn't get their Lithuanian citizenship back in time. They didn't have it back in time. Those people currently can't can't make any claims and that's not just the, those were our citizens we we would like them to be treated equally and to have not no discrimination on the basis of citizenship or nationality therefore we're looking for them to 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 uh, open negotiations with the WJRO and the and the Lithuanian uh, Jewish uh, uh, Jewish community with Jewish community of Lithuania, uh, therefore, so to, 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 to liven that process back up uh, and also asking them to, to look at the issue of airless property, which to, to date has not, been, has not been dealt with. And of course, as you know, the vast, vast majority of, of, of Jews of Lithuania were killed, uh, murdered with no living heir. Uh, and so on the other issue of, uh, uh, that you mentioned, which is of memory issues or sort of treatment of, of those who might have perpetrated, uh, been collaborated, 
collaborated with the Nazi uh, destruction of the Jewish community of Lithuania. That's something that you know the current government is, has really made some progress on, and we saw their prime minister um, recently, uh, uh, I believe, was it in, in, in just a couple of months ago, uh, attend a commemoration uh, and, and begin a process of commemorations across Lithuania from June until December of this year with these uh, anniversary events of various pogroms and and and, and, and persecutions uh, that their prime minister has reached out and said, let's look back at our history. Let's look back with, with open eyes. And I'm paraphrasing, uh, you'd have to read her actual speech. But the bottom line is we did have very good discussions with the government and with the par, uh, of, uh, an array of parliamentarians from different parties, uh, including Emmanuel Zingeris, uh, who's a Jewish member of parliament in Lithuania, uh, and said, look, what, you know, and he's in the governing coalition parties. And we said, look, look what, what can we, what can we help with? And I think one thing is we could really all uh, do, do uh, whatever we can uh, to engage on Holocaust education, because as you know, in Lithuania and in many other countries, um, they're, they're really, unfortunately for all these years have been so focused on the, the, the destru destruction wrought during the communist era, the Soviet domination, the Soviet persecution, that the Holocaust is a distant, distant memory and the people who suffered from it are largely murdered <laughs> or they fled. Uh, and so what are the children going to learn? How are they going to learn about it if, if there's not some sort of opening where we can engage all of us who, Lithuanian historians who've written one, uh, under the presidential commission, who've written amazing uh, textbooks and history books. How do we get those taught in the Lithuanian school program? How can we help? What programs can we do so that the, the lessons of the Holocaust are not lost and that people don't assume this was done by Germany? It had nothing to do with us. No, they were actually uh, everyone can point to uh, to testimony uh, that, that the Lithuanian there were Lithuanian perpetrators, and we should not be rehabilitating people who perpetrated crimes of the Holocaust. There's no point in doing so. And all the 34 member nations of the IRA pledged uh, in, uh, in uh, I believe it was in Berlin in, in June of 2020, uh, issued a, uh, or, or August of 2020, issued a declaration saying, uh, condemning any attempt to rehabilitate uh, the reputations of those who participated directly or indirectly in the crimes of the Holocaust. So we've all, we've all issued this declaration. So let's live up to it. Let's not honor and glorify those people. Let's mm -hmm. teach honestly about what happened. There's no harm in teaching honestly. Not everyone could be perfect and there were something we can learn about why we weren't perfect. What can we learn from that so that we can do better in the next attempt to dehumanize uh, another population? Mm -hmm. Wow, so I, I think this ties in actually with, we wanted to show one more, one short clip, uh, one last clip from a, a child of Holocaust survivors. Uh, maybe you can share that. Uh, we can share that on the screen. Um, and I think it speaks to the engagement of this issue for the second generation um, of children of Holocaust survivors. And maybe we can just share that uh, video with you, that brief clip. My name is Leora Zalman. Hello from San Diego. As we mark the one year anniversary of the Just Act report, I'd like to point out one of the key findings that unfortunately directly affects me. Poland has not yet enacted comprehensive legislation on national property restitution. This makes Poland the only European Union member state not to do so. Currently, the new law under consideration in Poland will make it nearly impossible for anyone to get back their rightful property. I would like to briefly share my story. My mother was from a large Jewish Polish family. She survived the Holocaust, the only one in her family to do so. She had property in Poland before the war a small two-story apartment building. She filed a claim for that property in 1949. I filed a claim in Polish court in 2017. And for four years, I've been trying to prove that I'm the rightful heir to my mother. And even though I've submitted every and all requested legal documents, including her notarized will and probate documents, the Polish court refuses to hear my case. And so I still wait. Poland should do the right thing. Thank you for listening to my story. Well, I think that just sort of, in some ways, just summarizes a, a one one personal story uh, that comes back to where we where we started with. So we have we have three minutes left. Um, Sherry, your term is coming to an end, um, and uh, we will miss you. We wish you enormous success. Um, just tell us a little bit, maybe just uh, in the last couple of minutes, your thoughts on on on, on uh, thoughts on the future, and maybe any particular story about a any particular individual or any particular story you want to share with us, and and how you see the work of the office continuing going forward. 
Sure, I'll try to do that uh, briefly then. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an amazing privilege to do this work and to have a team of people all uh, leaning in the same direction with me, leaning in on very difficult issues and having no challenge too great or too small. Uh, and so, uh, so, so that, that's really the bright spot is that there's great support within this uh, State Department, within the administration, really across, uh, across administrations uh, and, and, and both houses of Congress. And that gives us the power uh, to, to continue and work for this, this justice for those who, who, who find really doable, achievable ways to spread out over the years and do something as the as the, the speaker had just said, uh, actually all of your speakers have said, do the right thing. And that the right thing is really just doing a measure of justice. You can't bring, you can't undo it. We're not blaming anyone um, for, for Nazi crimes. What we're actually asking is for, is for compensation for property that was confiscated, a measure of compensation. And we think that's so fair uh, and so doable and that people who actually pledge to do that. So let's uh, let's get that done. Um, in terms of reflecting, I'm uh, moving on soon um, to to start German language training and and get ready for position. Uh, my, my family and I will go to Berlin. Um, uh, I'll be the cultural affairs counselor at, at a fantastic mission, of course, coordinating all the consulates as well uh, across Mission Germany. Uh, and, and so I look forward to, to doing that. Um, and, and I'll be succeeded by another career member of the Senior Foreign Service, Ellen Germain. And Ellen uh, is uh, currently, uh, was just rec until recently, maybe a few weeks ago, was the DCM, the Deputy Chief of Mission at our embassy in Sarajevo, and has served in a number of countries in the Middle East and Europe, which make her uh, experience very relevant to this position. So she'll start at, toward the end of August. Uh, Stacey Bernard Davis, our Deputy Envoy, who came on board a couple months ago, will bridge that gap and be acting until Ellen arrives and get her onboarded. And, and we'll continue that great cooperation and information sharing that, that we can help uh, to drive these issues forward. Um, I think having uh, President Biden and, and Secretary Blinken uh, lean in so hard on these issues for justice for, for survivors and their families uh, is a great boon as well. And I think it's a topic for diplomatic negotiations. And I'll just say, as you as you know very well, and many people listening know, not everything we do is something we, we tweet about. Some of it is just diplomatic negotiations that need to stay in that channel in order to have the hope of success. But please know that we're, 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 we're fighting that fight, struggling that struggle to, to explain to people how they can do it and why it's the right thing even for their own economies to, to, to clear up these property ownership issues with, with settlements um, and comprehensive legislation. So I think with that, I'll just say uh, it's been a privilege and, and I'm not finishing yet. I've still got some time left, but, uh, but the team is here and, and that knowledge with, with Stu Eisenstadt as our expert advisor and with the great support of our uh, people across this building uh, from human rights to the Office of Legal Affairs, uh, Office of the Special Envoy to combat, uh, monitor and combat anti-Semitism. We're all uh, the Office of International Religious Freedom. We're all working together behind the scenes to work on these issues and, and make progress and have more success stories for you by next year. Terrific, terrific. Well, Jerry, we wish you all the best. Details of um, uh, the, uh, the office are uh, on screen. There's been a lot of questions have come in. We haven't had a chance to answer uh, most of them. We'll try and send out answers uh, uh, to those of you who posed questions who we didn't reach. And uh, Sherry, the best of luck. I'm sure we will be crossing paths soon. Uh, again, and continue to do that. And thank you for everything you've done and your office has done. And uh, we will continue to uh, advocate uh, to fight for, for justice. We'll continue to have uh, webinars like this. So for those of you who've uh, found it interesting, we'll be sharing uh, updates on new webinars uh, to bring this message out and continue to bring it out to a wider and an international audience. So thank you, everyone. And um, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.